your home is full of products that are a health disaster. What really scares me a lot is the forever chemicals. These are endocrine disruptors and show up in beauty products and personal care products and everything else, contributing to weird things like diabetes, high cholesterol, metabolic conditions, kidney cancer. Fast fashion helps us keep up with the latest trends on the cheap. Canned food and snacks in colorful wrappers make eating effortless and Bluetooth headphones make for a hassle-free podcast listening experience. But what are they doing to your health? There is on average 8,000 chemicals from the growing of the most heavily sprayed crop on the planet, cotton, to creating your t-shirt is 8,000 chemicals. Plastic chopping boards, makeup, toxic floor cleaners, scented candles, microwaves, footwear, even toilet roll. Things we think are convenient are actually making us sick. 99% of everyone on the planet in the 90s had these nasty chemicals already in their blood. Think about that for a second. Darren Olian says these modern conveniences might even be fatal and you're gonna love the solutions we discussed today. By following nature, you get your own Ozempic naturally without buying it from a pharmacy for God's sakes. Welcome to the Health Optimization Podcast. I'm Tim Gray, the UK's leading biohacker. This podcast is all about gaining actual advice from the world's top experts and sharing new findings and breakthroughs in nature, science, biohacking, technology, and longevity research to help you live longer and happier. So much of what we do to make our lives easier is also making us sicker. Hidden toxins and chemicals in everything from the clothes we wear to the foods we eat and the air we breathe are doing major damage. Cancer, obesity, diabetes, autoimmune diseases, hormonal imbalances, allergies, and neurological disorders, they are all on the rise. That's why we need to return to a more natural way of living. And Darren is just the man to tell us how. Darren is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Super Life, and the host of the Super Life podcast. You may also recognize him from the Netflix series, Down to Earth, which he co-hosted with Zac Efron. Today, we're focusing on his most recent book, Fatal Conveniences, where he details exactly what the modern world is doing to our health and how to fix it. If you're ready to throw out the crap filling up your cupboards and make some big changes in your life and health, then buckle up. Darren. I've wanted to record with you for a very long time now, and it's been a few years since we've hung out, and welcome to the show. Dude, I'm stoked to be here, Tim. Uh, I look forward to this conversation for sure, man. So i got to be honest before we kick off today, that when I saw you on the Netflix documentary with Zach years ago, I was like, I love this dude. I love his energy. I love how he's always got a big smile on his face, and I loved your level of integrity around plants and um, respecting animals. And when, for instance, Zach went off and had the meat option, you went down and had the vegetarian bowl. And while it's not how I live, I choose not to live plant-based. I really, really, I would say, you know, not in a weird way, fell, fell, fell in love with you at that point. And I was like, I have to meet this dude. I have to I have to work with him in some way. And obviously you spoke at the Health Optimization Summit, I think it was 2022 or 2023 now. So it's really nice to be catching up a few years later with what's been going on ever since. So thank you very much for coming on again, mate. Yeah, thanks, brother. I mean, I think uh, reputation and integrity without judging other people is is a big key that I like to live by for sure. And I'm glad that it came off in the show. 100 percent. it's like yeah it's like even in tough times you're like yeah i love it <laughs> so it's like yeah, it's so good <laughs> so good <laughs> so for those of you that those are the listeners that don't know you and i'm sure there's not really many that don't but do you want to talk us through a little bit about your background and experience darren yeah sure i mean <clears throat> i got hurt playing american football uh, which really propelled me into physiology, kinesiology, nutrition in my undergrad, which was a blessing in disguise, even though not great at the time. Uh, that started my curiosity in, in the body and understanding movement and understanding physiology and then ultimately understanding enough in nutrition to get myself into trouble. And, and with that, I think the curiosity of Nutrition really got sparked by way of uh, some retired doctors would mentor me and 
in in Colorado where I lived, and uh, they said this is this is what healthcare actually is, and of course I knew that, but then just getting that research directly from them and showing me functional functional medicine before functional medicine was a term. Um, then that got me understanding enough in the nutrition space to look at products and supplements and realizing, wow, most of this stuff is saying one thing and it's actually not validated by its integrity of tested, clean, effective compounds. So uh, the frustration in that led me to, why don't I just do this myself? And so I jumped on planes and went to the Amazon and many corners of the globe looking directly at and with indigenous people and and looking at botanicals and looking at plants and and foods and how they actually can be grown and preserved and and used in products so i got hired by a company here in the us called beachbody i developed some many products for them uh <clears throat> that did really well and really Tim, that was the spark of seeing the world in such a big way. And I I couldn't brush off these first moments of of seeing environmental pollution in my face, seeing not only clothing pollution, plastic pollution, uh, villages throughout Africa, not even seeing what clean water looked like. and seeing just this, this, the underbelly of the modern world in the environmental pollution side of stuff. So that's what really got me sparked into once you see stuff and feel stuff and meet people, your, your life and your trajectory in the life is, is forever changed. And so I kind of took that on. I took, took on a lot of water cleaning projects throughout Africa. And, and with that, I was like, okay, we got to get people healthy. We got to get them. I, I didn't understand why in our modern world, why we had, you know, two to three billion people on the planet not access to clean food and water and, and living in poverty and living in pollution. I just didn't make sense to this kind of small town kid. So that that's what sparked kind of this idea of people over the years saying, hey, you should do a show on superfood hunting. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. But really, but really the, the broader perspective of not only melding health and the environmental awareness uh, with, uh, I've always been inspired by people doing great things in the world. Um, that's a side of me that I, I am very involved in, but I just don't talk about much with clean energy tech and stuff like that. But I've been exposed to a lot and have had a lot of great people in my life. And so the show, the Down to Earth, came by way of just kind of writing down what I wanted to do. And unbeknownst to me, Zach had reached out to me for other reasons. And so that was the birth of the show, really. But, but, but backtracking a little bit, Tim, which is relevant for the conversation we're going to get into. My father in the 90s, while I was at university... My dad got exposed and uh, was one of the early sufferers of uh, chemical sensitivity. So my dad couldn't even wear a t-shirt that had dyes in it. He couldn't be around anyone that had a fragrance. He couldn't have uh, clothing on or be around anything that had false cleaning, chemical cleaning products, you name it. My dad was kind of a prison in this modern world that came by way of later in his life. And so that was the first, quote unquote, (laughs) pun intended, exposure (laughs) I got to this world of like, holy shit, this is this isn't just my dad. This isn't just, I'm thinking my dad's a little nuts. Um, this is a really big problem. And, and, and cut to, yeah, I didn't know how to tackle it. I didn't know how to talk about it. And, um, but a- along the way, as you probably have found this too, as you kind of lean into it and open up this world, more information follows you and shows you and, I remember 25 years ago, a researcher showing me data on electromagnetic fields, 25 years ago. 
and showing uh, RNA and DNA challenges through the electromagnetic field of sharing information and potentially creating gylomas and carcinogenic tumors. And I was like, holy shit, like, this is, this is crazy. So every one of these things you and I talk about, how they're created is detrimental to the world at large mm -hmm. by way of uh, aerosolized in the air, uh, polluting in the water, polluting in the waterways, affecting insects and, and animals and vertebrae and, and fish and you name it. So it's very personal as I change what I do and it's personal to all of us as it relates to the overall. It's amazing how many people I speak to where something like how they're exposed to this area and their level of curiosity and wanting to help the world and people around them then takes them down the rabbit hole and they end up, you know, obviously in positions like you and I are. And it's really interesting to hear the pattern, for instance, and many of the specialists I speak to all seem to have a similar thing or with a parent, for instance, it, for instance, my mum, <laughs> my mum had, let's say, leaky gut when back in the 80s now, and everyone thought she was crazy for talking about this. And she was always in the, the local health food store. And so I was brought up with this viewpoint and it didn't hit me until I needed it. Uh, <laughs> but it's, yeah, so it's really, really, really uh, good to hear how you got into it. Thank you. So, I mean, you spent most of your adult life researching what we what you now call fatal conveniences which is such a brilliant label in fact it's inspired me with a lot of the content that i do but like what led you to figure out fatal conveniences as a term that that was actually that first researcher that i had met dr mosen who were uh in uh 25 years ago he would often, he was a very brilliant guy and did all kinds of um, deep rabbit hole work um, on uh, health, nutrition, biomimicry, uh, mathematics as it related to biomimicry, uh, as it related to the structures we're in, as the colors we wear. This guy was one of the most brilliant people I have ever met. And he changed my way of looking at the world and looking at nutrition and looking at... So he would often come up with terms that he would have to make and create in order to, to describe where he was taking someone in, in a reorientation of education. He gave me that term. Mm. He gave me that term 25 years ago where he was like, well, this is... This is so easy and it's such a convenience, mm. but it's a fatal convenience mm. because with, with the use of it, it may be acutely convenient, but it has long-term consequences. So yeah, the, the, the term was given by him. I love it. I love it. I remember the first time I saw the, the fatal conveniences from in your content, it was about the microwaves. And, <laughs> and actually, when you think about a microwave, they are brilliant, but they're also brilliantly bad. And it's like, right. when you think, when I, whenever I hear the word fatal conveniences, my mind immediately goes to that microwave because that's the first bit of content that I was ever exposed to. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so it's, it's great. So I mean, Let's get into the specific conveniences um, that we need to be aware of. What do you think are the three worst offenders? You know, what really scares me a lot is the forever chemicals because of their... When you talk about parabens and phthalates, these are endocrine disruptors and not great and show up in beauty products and personal care products and everything else. The body can, they do have half-lives in the body. So the body can get rid of them. The problem is that they, people keep reapplying, obviously. The forever chemicals, the ones that persist, the ones that don't have any biological uh, or, uh, origins, those scare me. And what I mean by that, which we all know, and your listeners probably have heard by now, and, and these, this PFOS category or this pre- and polyfluoral alkali substance. Now, these things have been slammed together through nasty chemistry of a lot of fluorine gas and carbon molecules. And, it, and what it did was it created a very unnatural substance with both hydrophilic and hydrophobic 
uh, ends of it. So it's different than like a heavy metal, for example, as another example. Heavy metals, we can know that we can chelate those out, right? So we can eat greens and chlorophyll and cilantro and do other cleansing protocols based on how many someone has and we can chelate those out of those out of the body these pfos chemicals it's not a flippant term it's a forever chemical forever in the sense that we have no idea how to get rid of get get it out of our system our bodies and we don't know how to get it out of the environmental system at large that is really scary and when you start looking at how dangerous they are to the biological system and the environmental system carcinogenic uh contributing to weird things like diabetes high cholesterol metabolic conditions specific cancers like kidney cancer uh these kinds of things are really scary and the bioaccumulation of them so let me just go a little bit down the rabbit hole. I got to interview the PhD, one of the first people to create the protocols to test the, the forever chemicals in blood in the 90s at 3M. So 3M, DuPont created the first pre and pro polyfluoral alkali substances. 3M then took them to the market. Yeah. And we're talking in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2020. Now think of this now. She developed the protocol and came, up, came to the determination that 99% of everyone on the planet in the 90s had these nasty chemicals already in their blood. <laughs> think about that for a second. And they, all, they just flippantly said, because they did no tests, they said, oh, they're fine. Hmm. So I am aggressively working with companies who I know are making different algae-based uh, competitive products that will be able to transition off of these PFAS. And what are they exactly? So people will really know. It's the non-stick. Hmm. What they're good at is they're heat resistant, they're slippery, and they're really good at their job, so they stay. So all food that comes in contact and it slips off the packages, that's because of PFAS. Water-resistant PFAS. Thank God they finally banned it in fire retardant in California, but they used to blast that all over, all over the place, and God knows we have a lot of fires. So th these things show up in a lot of different ways, and they persist. So these, this classification, Tim... Mm. These things really freak me out, but but a lot of them, obviously, plastics, microplastics, petroleum, dyes, azo dyes, all these mm. things. There's a good class of things that freak me out. <laughs> the one that freaks me out most is perfume, and mm. and obviously, forever chemicals are are a major issue for obvious reasons. But the one I find funniest but scariest is perfume because. Three is it up to three hundred chemicals which haven't been tested on humans are being sprayed and wait for it straight on the thyroid or right on the neck. Oh, I want to smell good right here. And it's like, right. and then people saying, "Oh, my thyroid antibodies are super high. I don't know why my body temperature is low and <laughs> I'm putting on weight." Right. It's like, are you spraying around three hundred unknown chemicals on your thyroid twice a day? <laughs> yes, but oh, it can't be that. <laughs> so I always find it. <laughs> mind-blowing yeah you're right man these fragrances and again there's a bunch of these loopholes as well in terms of they don't need to classify their proprietary blends and these things are major endocrine disrupting and so let's unpack that a little bit on endocrine disrupting chemicals and <laughs> your thyroid being one of the major endocrine uh, organs but these are ovaries, these are testes, these are thiamus, this is immune system. Like, the, this is the master communication system of your body that's being hijacked because you think you want to smell a certain way. <laughs> and now you're reapplying, to your point, proximity. And we're going to get into this in a lot of different ways. Proximity is very dangerous. 
proximity and persistence in the wrong way, right? So if you want to exercise and have and eat well, you're going to get great results. But if you're also going to apply dangerous things, not work out, all of that stuff, that that also is a habit that's going to create a lot of damage for you. So proximity of fragrances and endocrine disrupting and possible carcinogenicity, like these kinds of things are very dangerous and transdermal. And and people people don't realize that, you know, again, like the deodorants and the fragrances and the deodorants and the aluminums and, and our lymphatic system, which is a fluid system intimately connected to the modulation of our immune system, these things, to, to your point, the fragrances involved in so many products that we believe is, you know, connected to this is the way I smell, this is the way I want to smell, this is the way I like my shirt to smell. We then have these habit-forming dopamine effects tied to toxic products so we keep applying and that's where that's where the danger really starts to increase yeah it's crazy so people often think about the things they're consuming but what about how rarely they consider what they're actually wearing and how Mm -hmm. big of an issue do you think is clothing i would say it is it is such a major issue that is even to this day when you unpack it people can't grok it so keep in mind that 99 percent of your clothing is synthetic uh is chemicalized and it is petroleum based it is oil it is dyes it is bleaching agents it is pesticide and herbicide uh, there is, on average, Tim, about 8,000 chemicals from the growing of the most heavily sprayed crop on the planet, cotton, conventional cotton, to, to creating your t-shirt is 8,000 chemicals. Now, tell, tell me that is not the weirdest thing in the world, not even getting into the slave labor that it takes in the, uh, to, to produce a shirt that is too cheap. Um, so the clothing industry, and, and and now we we actually test it. I'm actually next week going to two film festivals where a, a film that I was a part of called Let Them Be Naked with my good friend Jeff Garner, who's been an advocate and a fashion designer in the clean designing space for a better part of 25 years. We're launching this documentary um, talking about this very thing. And we did tests going back to PFOS, Tim. We went into a lab. And you know I love this shit. When we're actually we're actually in the lab, the the peep the the lab technicians don't know what we're testing, but we cut off a piece of cloth and we had her do a, a fluorine mm. uh, fluorine test and a precipitation test on this piece of clothing. And what we found was it was uh, 10 times the amount that they even uh, put as a standard in California. There shouldn't be any, but it was 10 times higher. And you know what it was? It was a stewardess's uniform. (laughs) Uh, Because, of course, they don't want it to wrinkle and they don't want it to stain. So they blast these poor stewardesses with with these dangerous and now that again that's transdermal what you put on goes in your body um so so this is something we need to wake up to and we need better solutions for it too the other side of it is the second largest polluter on the planet people don't realize that the clothing they wear it might as well be a water bottle does it make sense to put a water bottle on does it make sense to work out in a water bottle does it make sense to open up your pores as you're sweating to allow pesticides, herbicides, dyes, uh, formaldehyde is a massive uh, exposure element from clothing, and of and of course then the then the PFAS stuff. So 
We have so gone so far unnatural in clothing. It's astonishing. And it's, it's a very dangerous thing. And again, it's proximity and duration. I would say, here's the takeaway. Change your underwear first. Organic, cotton, <laughs> get it off your genitals, like plastics. And you know, we're probably going to mention this at some point. So I might as well now, plastics are showing up everywhere inside the body in the testes, in the heart, in the organs, in the blood. Where do you think all that's coming from? And we just don't know what plastics actually does to us. I mean, actually, I shared some content out a few few months ago, and I said in it, and we don't even know what plastics do to us yet. And someone said, exactly, it hasn't been quantified. How do we know it's bad for us? So I was like, <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> it's like common sense should be a bit more common. It's funny you mentioned about underwear because I have a I've always had a thing about buying organic cotton underwear actually. And considering I mean even now sitting in the podcast studio it's quite warm but I wear always wear cotton or actually linen is my new favorite actually. Organic linen actually and I've even got organic linen bed sheets on my Samina bed and um organic linen t-shirts. Now I don't know if you've heard about this, this is a slight detour from from the topic but i read information a few weeks ago a few months ago rather about the frequency of linen and you know even organic cotton has a frequency level of like five organic cotton and linen having a frequency of three to five thousand and again i haven't I haven't gone in deep enough yet but it's something that i i am planned to do some content and further research on but it's like it resonates with the frequency of the body for your electrical charge better if you have a higher frequency material, which is why generally people feel much more relaxed when they're wearing linen versus synthetic crap like, you know, Gymshark or, or Lululemon, which is plastic. It's crazy. Yeah. Have you, I guess you've explored this and gone down the rabbit hole on this somewhat, have you? Yeah, a little bit. You know, it's, it, it's a, the, the basis of it is we've lost touch with we are electromagnetic fields. We are electromagnetic field generators. And so even the, even the heart is a massive electromagnetic vortex, right? Um, so, so the conduction of our bodies, right? And so linen being a very natural fiber, cotton being a very natural fiber, it's like how can anything conduct the proper electromagnetic fields with the environment because we're constantly in the, and we can get into emfs and everything else but we are supposed to be conductive we're supposed to be interacting with our environment we're supposed to always receive information and give information to our to our field right so so when we shut that off through all of these um synthetic materials we're we're cutting ourselves off from the natural world. And so it just continues to go down the road of an isolation and almost this n forced narcissism that we have, that we are just this individual and nature is out there, right? So anyone and everyone, if you go outside, go out in nature, if you live in a city, you know you always feel better. You know, because there's this natural biorhythms that are all around you. Why do you put your feet on the ground? <laughs> you know, it's like that that discharge of positive electrons and the negative influx. And, and I don't mean negative like bad. I mean negative influx into the body. Like these are all natural uh, mechanisms that the body needs. So I just go into that field of understanding natural fibers will allow you to still conduct that electricity rather than cutting yourself off. And linen seems to be one of the highest conductors of that electro communication with our environment. It uh, makes me think of another fatal convenience, probably one of the, one of the worst ones in my opinion is rubber soled shoes <laughs> because you're talking about electrons and uh grounding and electrical charge for the body it's amazing it's like the amount of times i've been out in london in in warmish weather not that that happens too often um and I'll, I'll, I'll be going for a tennis lesson or something or other and there's parks next to the tennis courts all the staff the office workers that are crammed in a little blue lit 
office all day are out in the park eating their lunch on the grass shoes off or just chilling it's funny how we naturally gravitate back to nature and we finally intuitively know that we need this and yet we're so disconnected from it wearing rubber sole shoes insulated from the electrical charge of the planet and therefore more stress so it's, it's actually interesting about the biorhythm of the planet and nature of how how we we are actually attracted to it uh totally and yet so removed from it so it may surprise people that you've got sparkling water in your list. <laughs> <laughs> Why should people stick to normal filtered water or spring water instead? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the over-carbonation is like, listen, first off, at, at the end of the day, no problem if you want to drink it every once in a while. The problem is that when people... No problem if you're going to have, you know, your bad underwear on today. The whole thing is you got to just kind of don't get too crazy about this stuff. But the problem that people get addicted to this over carbonization that can add a lot of disruption in the digestive system uh, and uh, a lot of gassing, a lot of bloating and a lot of acidity in a way that's different than normal water. Now, uh, the plain water or filtered water, again, water is a very big topic. You and I could spend a week on water alone. But purified water, if you have access to spring water, then obviously that's the gold standard. Make sure it's tested. Make sure it's not influenced by by contaminants, obviously, but filter your water because half of the population now is being exposed by PFAS through the water as well. Um, and then you have to look at different aspects of water, total dissolved solids, right? TDS. So you want to keep that on the lower level unless it's in nature, unless it's tested. Now, TDS also shows up as contaminants. So TDS doesn't necessarily mean high TDS is good. A high TDS could also be a high contaminants of pollution. So, but a clean water with a, a TDS of minerals, that's a really good idea. Mm -hmm. um, so purified water, electrolytes, sodium for tonicity. And tonicity is that cellular gradient of sodium and potassium. Uh, sodium chloride is great. Some trace minerals are great. A pinch of unrefined salt. If you want to go next layer, you can go she legit. You can go things like that. And then if you also want, you can squeeze a lemon in your water. You can get infused full of electrolytes and, and that kind of structured water. So, I, you know, the, these things are common sense, but also we get duped and then we get addicted to the carbonation, the tickling, the <laughs> whatever flavors or whatever they have in it. So over time, that's not your choice for good cellular hydration um, or good digestion. Um, you want to stick to purified water. And obviously, reverse osmosis is a great, uh, easy financially easy choice and then a glass water bottle i travel with my glass water bottle and that's the that's an easy fix because now you've created a clean water source you've eliminated uh exposure to plastics and also you've eliminated all of the exposure of un unwanted pollution in that water mm, yeah great great points on all of those i love that something i want to add on i don't know if you've seen the account and i can't remember the name of it off the top of my head but on instagram there's an account verisudian Ver water or something and she freezes water in a petri dish <laughs> yeah, yeah. and puts like yeah. a leaf underneath the the petri dish or a coin or a picture or something or other and when the water is in glass being frozen it takes up the shape in the freezing of the object below it, right? So you, you obviously, you're, you're aware of this. People listening to the podcast probably haven't heard this and it might be a bit woo, but the thing is, it may be a bit woo, but you can try it at home and you can see how the water takes up the structure of the things around it. In plastic, 
it doesn't have a structure. It looks like a mess. But when it is in glass, it looks like a spider's web. It looked like a beautiful nature doing its thing. So it's actually really interesting because I, I haven't seen what sparkling water does uh, <laughs> to the structure. But I do. I mean, yeah. I enjoy sparkling water just because I drink so much water. I've, I, I got bored of the plain stuff, but maybe I should... Uh, <laughs> tone it down a bit <laughs> yeah yeah i mean again like i don't know if we have time for the full uh on water but water is something when looked upon you said it earlier uh, you know once you start looking at things the 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 gateway opens up and so the the research around water is publicly not even acknowledged barely at all but the researchers really doing the work i spent three days in Bulgaria in 2018 with some of the top scientists, some of the smartest people I've ever met. And of, co of course, Dr. Jerry Pollack in the fourth phase of water discovered mm. what the, the gel-like substance that water takes on when it comes up in, against a hydrophobic uh, membrane of a, in this case, of a cell and then creates creates energy upon it coming close to a hydrophobic um, surface. And so the electrons start actually uh, creating energy. And so they realize that structurally, this water is, is doing something when it physically comes up to these barriers. But they're also, in the late Dr. Luc Montier, who I met back then, was a Nobel Prize winner for discovering the HIV virus. He got so fascinated by water, he spent the last part of his career, a uh, few decades studying water, and realized that the, the information, storage capacity, and sharing capacity of water was unlike any substance that we have ever understood. So keep in mind that water is liquid crystal. And what do crystals do? They conduct and move energy, mm. right? So we have a crystal in our freaking brain keeping us upright. And, you know, so, and, and the early radios allow for conduction of, again, we're going back to we are energy. And so they, they said that the amount of storage capacity in a droplet of water will make your head spin in terms of the capacity that it could hold that much storage capacity in a room full of 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 amazon storage capacitors of of information so we barely know anything about this it's not just h2o so mm -hmm. th this is a big big uh, and and keep in mind you can do a lot of things to support that you can increase energy by vor vortexing it you can increase energy by infrared light going up to it if you really have a red light you can put you can increase the hydrophilic properties of the water the exclusion zone that dr jerry was talking about just by putting uh infrared light red light around your water bottle so you can do a lot of things with water to make it more assimilative to your own structure uh to your own hydrative capacity so there's a lot there but I keep it really simple. People who really just need to stay away from the pollutants, the plastics, and get clean water, start there, uh, glass bottles, uh, and, and you're at least not continuously polluting yourself. Yeah, yeah, I, <clears throat> I, I'm a big fan of the whole water thing. I, it's funny <laughs> because when I first got ill, my first thing other than kidney stones was frequent urination, and I was peeing around 30 to 50 times a day. Oh, and then it was wow. it was like literally I'd have a drink or something and it seemed to pee twice as much as I would drink. And it, it, it's just, I couldn't go anywhere. It was a nightmare. And I saw many different urologists, had loads of different tests, had to carry a bottle around with me for 24 hours and measuring my pee for, you know, for everything. And um, I realized, and, and I, I saw many specialists, no one knew what it was. And then I decided to try different minerals one by one to see what helped me retain water because I did a bit of research. And in fact, potassium for me, within 48 hours of taking potassium, 198 milligrams twice a day, I, I stopped peeing and I now pee three to five times a day. And then for probably three years, I had to take potassium twice a day, every day to stop this issue. And then my body seemed to take up potassium better. Now, 
what I did alongside that, and I won't go into too much detail because it's not about me, but is I collated the mercury out of my body along the way mm. using mercury collation protocols. And from what I hear is that mercury competes for the cell with magnesium and other minerals. And therefore, you don't get the minerals into the cell that you need for, to, for instance, to retain water. So when you get the mercury out, you can utilize magnesium and potassium better and therefore mm. not need to supplement with it every day and just get it from your food. So it's like really, it's a, a a topic you're right we could go <laughs> very deep into but mm. that in abstract what i do now these days is i have a reverse osmosis filter system for my kitchen and i have a household filter actually got a new one going in this week for the showers because obviously we absorb stuff through hot showers as well so big on the list for modern convenience right now is a very controversial one and this is our second to last question of the day <laughs> a zempic <laughs> yeah, convenient exactly, yeah. for waste lo weight loss but a, pot <laughs> a potential uh, potential uh, disaster for health so where do you stand on it yeah man you know as you look at this stuff tim it's it's so interesting because i was like i didn't want to look at ozempic for a long time i was like what the hell is going on and so of course i look at it through the lens i look at it through and i'm like okay so Ozempic, it has semi-glutide. Semi-glutide is a synthetic form of GLP-1, a hormone, right? That allows for you to have sati satiation and it binds to the GLP-1 receptors and, and all of these things. And then you get greater weight loss and control of, of your cravings and all of these things. So then I'm like, okay, well... I would never go uh, for a drug. Why don't let's look at the natural mechanism? So the natural mechanism is always right in your face. So we have GLP-1 increase of GLP-1, which in this case Ozempic creates the semi-glutide, which is the GLP-1, right? So if you look at following nature, if you look at just your common sense of eating whole food, <laughs> in, this, in, in this case, whole food, high fiber, fruits, nuts, seeds, legumes, plants, guess what happens? You get a boost <laughs> of GLP-1, like massive amounts. So by following nature, you get your own Ozempic naturally without buying it from a pharmacy, for God's sakes. And so I just look at all of that stuff going, oh my God, we're trying to hack our way around again and have massive consequences. Now, the consequences are alarming from my perspective. They're starting to see suicidal tendencies in some of the population, that's probably not a good idea. Mm. And the massive loss in many people of their lean tissue. And that means muscle. And that's your engine. That's what you're trying to freaking preserve until you're dead. You want your muscle. You want your muscle. It's the engine for your endocrine system, your testosterone, men, and women for the balancing of hormones and balancing, you want a higher level of testosterone than, than what you think. You don't want too much estrogen dominance, especially as you go into menopause. So <clears throat> by taking this stuff, your potential of losing faster your, your muscle mass is, is, is some populations up to 20%. 20%. That's a, that's a dangerous uh, statistic. So, again, you look at this thing going, okay, now, I'll, I'll say this. If you're four or 500 pounds and you, you cannot and, and you, you, you have bypassed so many natural mechanisms that you, you are going to die in the matter of a short period of time because of these things, now I would say, like, that's probably a good idea. You know, get a doctor, get get this under control, and then get off of it, and then kick in your own natural mechanisms again by eating whole food and all, all of this stuff. So, 
so you can supplement your way through it. But but for the general population, it scares the shit out of me that people are jumping on this uh, when they don't need it. The funny two points here is that you said Whole Foods. I'm pretty sure the people that are on as MPIC aren't the ones eating Whole Foods, number one. And number two, <laughs> I wonder if those people are the ones that say, no, it's too expensive to eat healthy. <laughs> I wonder how much totally. Zempic actually costs. So yeah, so thank you, thank you for your take on that one. I mean, it's a controversial, but a really hot topic and important to discuss. I think right now because so many people are jumping on. Even I went to see a consultant a few weeks ago, and he said oh, I'm doing a Zempic at the moment. I was just like, wow, like it's crazy. So finally, Darren, tell us about your new book and what is the biggest thing the listeners will change in their daily lives after they've read it <laughs> oh geez uh yeah the book fatal convenience was two and a half years of a lot of research and about 15 researchers i actually I'm proud to say i don't know if i'm proud to say but i am say i didn't even use uh any of the AI or any of the bots at the time. So I, I did an old school. I resisted it through that whole process. But what it, what it allowed me to do is read way too much. Um, I hope people take away a few things. I hope they, they clean their water. I hope they filter their water. It's a big exposure there. I hope that they uh, stop eating ultra processed food. And I hope they stop putting their food in contact with plastics and phthalates and and things like that and i hope they they look at their personal care uh routine and the things that they're slathering on their body every day i hope that they take away the things that they're doing every day and they start questioning all of it one at a time you don't have to change it all, but start questioning every day the deodorant that you're putting under your armpit, the lotion that you're putting on, the fragrance that you're spraying, like you said, on your thyroid gland, the clothing that you're putting on, the convenience, uh, looking at convenience from a different lens. Is this really where I want this to take me in my life? We, we need to do a little bit better about you know, your, your Ozempic, uh, you know, question was perfect because we are in such a population where we just want a quick fix and we don't even, you, some of your listeners are probably tuning out already. They don't, well, maybe you're not listening. You've, you've trained your listeners quite well to, <laughs> to want to know more about this, but, but so many people, they don't want to know, like, uh, l just look at, people still eat fast food. I, I literally, Tim, like when I see people pull into a drive through when I'm driving by, I, I, I literally can't understand that you're paying for this stuff and you're putting it in your body. I just hope that people start to wake up and a population of us push back, population of us start changing our buying routine so that prices do come down. So that prices do modulate themselves better so that we, all of us have access to better and better choices. But I'm optimistic as hell. I always have been. And I'm connected to, to a lot of people and big systems. Like I said, I, I know a company creating alternatives to PFAS at scale and already working with some of the biggest box companies in the world to transition. Um, I'm also in touch with uh, some of the biggest companies in the world already committed and not even in the public yet to regenerative agriculture because it makes sense. So I, I just hope that we take better care of our our system, our body, and and the rest uh, it's none of my business. So I hope <laughs> <laughs> you know you know I, I again I just I just want I want people to live a super life. I really do. Mm -hmm. I, I want. I, I don't want people to be a victim. I saw my dad be a victim, not trying to be a victim, but a victim not out of choice, but out of the effect of the system. Um, and I don't know why it's upside down. It's crazy that we've allowed this uh, as, as a society, but we can do a lot. Mm -hmm. We can do a lot. There's a lot of choices that you and I have talked about uh, in, in this episode and also in other ways and and uh take one thing and move forward and 
then later do the next. Yeah, it's beautiful. One thing I want to specify to my listeners today is pick your poison. Like, don't get scared from everything being toxic around us. It's like, pick your poison one at a time. First of all, change your toothpaste and change your shoes or whatever, whatever. But don't <laughs> stress about it because stress is the biggest killer of them all. And uh, probably the most, the more, the more immediate one with exceptions. So don't stress about it. Pick your poison. If you like your fragrance, make sure you don't fl- f- spray it on your thyroid, <laughs> maybe on your shirt instead. But change slowly, bit by bit, and don't don't stress about it. Because, you know, I found that when I was hypervigilant of all the things around me, I got quite stressed and didn't want to go near anything. And it was like, actually, that was making me more sick. So just bear that in mind, guys. Darren, thank you so, so, so for much for coming on today. I know you have a busy schedule and um, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing this with everyone. Yeah, man. Thanks for for making it a, a fun journey, and thank you for your mission. And I appreciate that, and 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 your time today, and your listeners' time. Thanks, man. A massive thank you to my guest Darren Olian. Learn more and find Darren's book, Fatal Conveniences, at darrenolian.com. You've been listening to the Health Optimization Podcast. I'm Tim Gray. Comment and leave the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it and subscribe to my channel to see more. See you next time and remember, let's spread the health.